Hello, and welcome to Occupied Thoughts, a podcast brought to you by the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I'm Sarah Ann Minkin, Director of Programs and Partnerships at the Foundation. Today is March 9th, 2023, and I'm happy to be here with Hagai Matar. Hagai is an award-winning Israeli journalist and political activist. He's Executive Director of 972 Advancement of Citizen Journalism, an Israeli nonprofit that publishes two independent media outlets. The first is 972 Magazine, which I expect and hope that our podcast listeners are very familiar with. 972 Magazine is essential reading for anyone interested in or involved with Israel-Palestine. And the second is 972's sister site, also essential. The sister site, it's called Local Call, and it publishes in Hebrew. Chagai, I know you are incredibly busy right now. The country is in massive upheaval. There's so much going on. Last time we talked, you said there was so much chaos that, that this government was creating so much chaos that no one could keep up. Just now, a moment ago, you said to me, there are protests all the time. No one can keep up. There's so much going on. So I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to sit with us today. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for having me. So I, I want to talk to you about everything that is going on, this, this new wave of protest against the Israeli government, uh, the, the government's plans to remake to remake government, to remake uh, what government looks like in Israel, the politics of Palestinian citizens joining, not joining uh, the protests and why, what's happening with Palestinians from the river to the sea, this incredible, horrifying ramp up of, of violence, um, violence by settlers backed by the IDF, violence from the IDF. We have so much to talk about. Um, and I, I'm just going to put in Another plug that people read 972, you, that your coverage of what's happening is, is unsurpassed and is absolutely essential. And I'll have links in the show notes. Um, but let's, so as, as a way to organize our conversation, it is now 10.15 at night on Thursday evening, March 9th, where you are. So what happened today? Today was another, what they call day of disruption. Can you just talk to us about, to, let's start with today. Sure, uh, and, and it's a lot. Uh, the day started with dozens of protests throughout the country with tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people participating. Um, and that included roadblocks in some of the major highways throughout the country. Um, it included basically a blockade on the air, airport uh, with the stated goal to prevent Netanyahu and his family fro from traveling to Italy um, on an official and pleasure uh, visit, uh, and a blockade, a water bl blockade with yachts and uh, rowing boats on the Haifa seaport. Um, so all that was just the first part of the day. Um, the protesters were actually able to force Netanyahu to take a helicopter into the airport, taking him directly to the plane, uh, because there was no way to reach the airport otherwise. Um, and so, so that was just the beginning. Then the rest of the day went on with additional roadblocks. Uh, and just this evening, uh, we saw a few additional protests with more roadblocks. Um, each of these protests has between several thousands, about tens of thousands of people participating. Um, during the demonstration tonight, two other things happened, three other things happened. One was that uh, Israeli President uh, Herzog, and Israel President is just a head of state, um, but he's been trying to lead negotiations between the coalition and the opposition uh, these days. And he made kind of an announcement, basically calling on the coalition to stop all the, the entire reform that it's promoting these days. Um, shortly after we heard that Itamar Benville, the fascist and the uh, current uh, minister of national security decided to remove the chief of the Tel Aviv police from his position because he's been too forgiving with protesters, not using enough violence, according to Ben Greer, against demonstrators. Um, and shortly after that, there were uh, reportedly, and the details are still coming in, um, two attacks in Tel Aviv, one a ramming attack um, against protesters in one of the demonstrations, and separately, reportedly, the details still coming in, uh, a Palestinian attacking 
Israelis at a cafe uh, shooting uh, probably one dead and several other injured. So all of that is just today. Wow, thank you for all of that. I hadn't heard of the, the ramming attack, the shooting attack uh, in central Tel Aviv. I didn't know that uh, anyone was killed. So, and the shooting, just to be clear, that so the Tel Aviv head of police was just removed. And then there was a shooting attack and this ramming attack. Is there a head of police in Tel Aviv? Was someone else elevated? Well, he, he will probably stay in Israel. He's on the scene, literally, as we speak. So okay. um, his removal will go into effect in the coming days, probably. Okay. Um, ben v himself, by the way, who usually goes to every event of a Palestinian attack, um, basically just tear up emotions, um, said that he won't be coming this time. Uh, it's assumed as in between facing the commander of the police that he just removed from office and navigating his way through all the protests that are now still happening in Tel Aviv, he preferred not to show up. He won't show up in Tel Aviv. Okay, thank you. So you gave us this, this big map of this big day of chaos um, or day of, it doesn't actually totally sound like chaos. It sounds extremely well organized. The flotilla and, and Haifa blockade, the blockading of streets and many different parts of the country in Tel Aviv, the major highways blockading the airport, everything you just told us. So who are these protesters? So people say tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, um, both. And we know that now, and as anyone who reads 972 knows, you've been writing about the protests since early mid January, I think when they when they started. Um, I want to ask you, so who the who are the protesters? Who's organizing the protests? And um, what are they calling for? So um, a lot of people are going out in the protests. Uh, we say tens of thousands because some of the protests can reach that size. But overall, if you look at how many people have gone out on the streets, have gone out on days of strike and disruption, the, the uh, accumulated numbers in the hundreds of thousands. Um, and I think while not entirely precise, um, the, the kind of common description of who is going out on the street, it's mostly uh, secular Jews. That's kind of the vast majority of protesters. There are exceptions. Uh, um, I didn't mention just because the day is so chaotic, but there was also a protest of Palestinians in the Nakab against house demolitions. Um, as, you know, and, and they were talking about is the movement for democracy, which is what's been going on throughout the country, is that something that we can fit into? Are people fighting for democracy willing to talk about demolitions, racist demolitions of Palestinian homes in the Nakab? Uh, so, so, you know, just kind of a small um, exception to the rule of who's protesting. So you have these protests that are kind of asking that question of do we belong or do we not? But the vast majority are, are Jewish seculars, um, mostly uh, like Tel Aviv is definitely the leading city. Um, there have also been very large demonstrations in Haifa and Jerusalem and other places. Um, it's been as a middle, upper middle class um, kind of movement referred to as elitist sometimes. I think it's true to a certain degree, but not entirely. Um, and, and the organizers come from kind of the very heart of the mainstream. We're talking people who are ex-senior uh, military, um, ex-senior police, ex uh, and and current politicians from the center uh, of the political map. Um, those are the people who are kind of organizing and coordinating, basically. Great, thank you. That's helpful. So um, you brought up the the exception to the protesters was this this uh, protest of Palestinian citizens today in Beersheba who were protesting against home demolitions or, or uh, orders for home demolitions of Palestinian citizens in the Nakab, in the, in the Negev, in that area. So talk to us about um, what you, the, the, the elephant in the room about, about Palestine, about this question of 
um, protesters are protesting for Israeli democracy, or they they think that this is the end of Israeli democracy. Um, you have written about these protests, protesters not showing up to protest against Israeli apartheid. They're protesting for the the the, the maintenance of a system that privileges Jews. Um, so protesting their uh, against what they call dictatorship for what we would call apartheid. Um, so unpack that for us, please, of, of what it means politically, but also what it means in terms of Palestinian citizens and their role within these protests or, or not. Sure, so, so I'll start with, with the movement itself and then kind of where Palestinians do or not connect. Um, the movement is very, very mainstream. It comes from the heart of Israeli mainstream and establishment. Um, if you see kind of the groupings, that's kind of the, the, the movement is massive and it's made out of different groups. So you have um, lawyers protesting, ex-judges protesting, um, physicians protesting, um, like all these groups separately and sometimes together. Um, you also Wait, have- Wait, I'm gonna interrupt you for, for one sec, sure. sorry. The groups that are protesting as groups, these these what we would exactly. call affinity groups, are they mm -hmm. all are they all professionally oriented? What you just named are are professions. Um, yes, I think that's the strongest denominator uh, okay. of these groups. Uh, so the, there's kind of the high tech protests, the financiers protests, um, and uh, an, an exception to to jobs. Um, is what we've recently been seeing a, a huge spike in conscientious objection in basically people who are uh, reserve service soldiers, uh, some of them in elite units, um, others in regular combat units and intelligence units, um, all saying that they will refuse to serve in the army if the, the bills that are currently proposed go through because Israel will then no longer be um, a democracy. Uh, so you can see all these protesters and at the same time, even within the heart of this establishment, um, you see legal advisors to the government, the police, the army, um, of government officials and different ministries are really pushing back against what the government is doing. So it's not just civilian protest outside of the systems of government, but the systems of government themselves are torn um, between the new government and the kind of um, senior leadership of ministries and uh, secu the security apparatus. So all of that is happening and because it is so much the establishment and the elite, um, basically the, the main theme of the protest movement is let's keep things as they are. Like this is basically a struggle to sustain the status quo of the way that the regime operates. Now, uh, you and I and many of our friends would uh, criticize the movement that it so inadvertently and somehow sometimes outspokenly um, supports apartheid. But many of the people that go out on the streets won't say like, I'm here to support apartheid occupation. And when challenged, they will say, I'm actually against the occupation apartheid, just that this isn't the right time. Like right now, we're facing a crisis of our own democracy, of our own survival. The Israeli economy is very likely to collapse if these bills pass uh, the Knesset. The Israeli army might not survive. We might all be in danger and we will be living in a dictatorship. So this is no time to talk about Palestinian rights. First, we guarantee that democracy survives, and then we can talk about other things. That would be kind of the, the common sentiment. Um, and, and because this is a movement basically to sustain the status quo, on the one hand, it is successful in getting a lot of people out in the street because the government is proposing a revolutionary um, um, in terms of transforming the entire nature of the regime. Um, so it's, it's understandable so, so many people are stepping out, but also it makes it much more difficult clearly for Palestinians and also for people who are in solidarity with Palestinians on, on the more radical uh, left um, to, to 
be excited and to be supportive of this protest movement. Thank you. That's that that I you laid that out so clearly, and I am grateful. Thank you for that. And and I'm also reminded that um, I think I can't remember now which which week, but there was a 972 article, which was basically that the, the Supreme Court has um, uh, the, the Supreme Court has given the green light to so many of the violations of Palestinian human rights. And it should, and it still must be protected. This was a sort of radical left take. Um, we just did a podcast last week, also about the Supreme Court's role in um, in uh, legitimizing oppression of Palestinians and 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 oppression, repression, and violation of Palestinian human rights. So anyone who is uh, coming from the place where we are on what we would call the left or among progressives doesn't look at the Supreme Court as this great arbiter of, of human rights or as this progressive institution that 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 protects human rights because of its work in uh, legitimizing violations of, of, of Palestinian human rights. And yet it needs to be saved. Can you unpack that for us? Sure. Uh, first, just like agreeing with what you said, I mean, it's 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 so absurd to see people in these protests saying that one of the reasons that the existing system, including the Supreme Court, needs to be defended is because it offers them as soldiers, politicians, generals, uh, protection from criminal investigations in The Hague um, and facing war crimes charges in foreign states, their ability, people are actually saying, if all these reforms pass and soldiers are given uh, automatic immunity from prosecution in Israel, we will not be able to travel abroad because the things we did or are doing in the army uh, now are kind of covered up by the Israeli legal system and they're presented to the world as we have our own internal um, robust um, criminal system that can identify war crimes and kind of prosecute offenders, which never happens. Like nobody prosecuted for war crimes in, in Israel. But the system seems robust enough and independent enough for other countries to say, well, Israel is doing fine by its own. Once you drop that, actually that's when people might get arrested when they fly abroad. So again, this is just to say how absurd it is for a protest movement, for democracy, basically to be saying, for us to be able to continue to commit war crimes, we need to protect the Supreme Court. And that makes it so much more difficult for us to support this protest movement. And, and that's where I think it, the, the interesting challenge is um, that uh, there's kind of a radical block or an anti-apartheid block that's been taking part in these protests from the very beginning, um, which identifies the threat of fully authoritarian regime. It will be terrible mostly for Palestinians, also for other types of dissidents and journalists like us, um, and for the broader society. So it is important to stop this uh, reform or, or coup d'etat from happening, and at the same time, to be out there on the street as a bloc in the sea of Israeli flags, which has kind of become the symbol of this protest because it's so mainstream, because it's so kind of keeps the status quo. So in that sea, have a block of people that are waving Palestinian flags, that are holding signs against apartheid, against colonialism, um, and, and against the Supreme Court in a way, kind of saying, yes, we need to reform the Supreme Court, but not cancel it, but make sure that it actually offers democracy and justice and equality for everyone. And the same goes for the entire regime. So, um, and there's this kind of constant uh, tension between that block and the rest of the demonstrators uh, where some would come and attack kind of this more radical block. Um, others would just kind of shrug and say, this isn't the time. And some are actually interested and intrigued. And we have seen a lot of people um, adopt messages from that block, and especially since the events in Hawara uh, last week, the, the kind of attack um, by settlers and the army on the village of Hawara, um, where suddenly this has become part of the messaging 
for the movement. Suddenly people are talking about what this government is doing is allowing even more extreme occupation and we're against the occupation and it's the occupation that is responsible for where we are right now. So we, there is some adoption uh, of that messaging by some of the protesters. Thank you for, for um, giving us this view of the, the radical block that is operating within protests. I imagine primarily within the Tel Aviv protests, maybe Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. Um, and Haifa and, and other places. It's actually an, an ongoing okay. uh, and growing um, part of the movement. Ta Great. So I, I know, this is one of the things I wanted to, to, uh, to ask you about. Um, this question of whether or not to participate in the protests, are they, are they so mainstream? Are they too mainstream? Are they an opportunity? Uh, what kind of oppor political opportunity are they? Um, and when I say, are they too mainstream? I don't mean because people on the left are, uh, are, are too cool to participate in, in something mainstream, but rather for all of the reasons that you've described, walking in a sea of Israeli flags, um, for instance, with uh, uh, em embracing and um, immersing yourself in nationalist symbols, which is not uh, usually the way that that radical blocks uh, like to walk around, um, which raises another. Well, I have questions for you about um, the Palestinian flag as well. But so, let me just ask you though specifically. Um, you said that the radical block is coming in with its own slogans and that people, some people are, are attacking, but other people are asking questions and that the slogans are, are spreading. You've seen, you've seen some growth there. What slogans are, are spreading? What, where do you see the, the, um, the growth and the spread of, of messaging coming from a more radical analysis of, uh, of the structure of Israeli government and of Israeli inequality as, as actually being something that takes into account the Israeli regime from the river to the sea versus uh, talking about Israeli democracy as something that is prim primarily for Jews. Right. Um, well, I think, you know, it's, it's you kind of can really point to a, a spectrum of messaging and what makes it easier as, you know, as a gateway kind of drug uh, for people to, to transition from the very strict Keep the status quo, protect our democracy messaging to a very radical message. You can really see a spectrum there. I think a uh, first step that people have been taking in mass is talking about Hawada, um, and it's easier for people, especially for secular people in Tel Aviv, to point the figure at the hilltop youth, at the setters, at the religious fanatics. It's so much the other in terms of how they perceive of themselves, that it's really easy. It doesn't feel like, you know, we are all complicit in the occupation or apartheid. Um, it's not about the Nakba and the right of return. It's basically saying those crazies who are going to burn villages, they are part of the enemy that we're demonstrating against. So that's, but that's like a step removed from we're not talking about the occupation at all. I think kind of the next step that people are willing to take um, and you can really imagine kind of a funnel, you know, some people would say this and then fewer would, would talk about there's no democracy with occupation, um, which, which I think is easier for people to handle, again, than messages around apartheid or carrying a Palestinian flag, but just saying, yes, as long as there's an occupation, we can't really say that there's democracy here. When there's millions of people under military regime, that's not a democracy. And you hear that, like in some of the of, of the messaging from the more mainstream people that are going in that direction. Um, and I think also we've been hearing that over the past week or so with this new wave of refusers. Um, it's interesting to see that they're they're talking about the occupation. Many of them feel extremely uncomfortable with serving the occupation, and they're kind of walking in between different points. They say, I've never supported the occupation. I always thought it needs to end, but I've been serving because I felt like um, 
you know, there's a democracy here and the uh, occupation was, uh, has been a democratic decision of the majority of Israelis. Um, and as long as that's a democratic ruling, I'm not going to go against it. As long as there are checks and balances on the power of the army, for example, the Supreme Court, I feel like there's a parameter that I'm working within. That's a democratic parameter. But now without those guardrails of, and, and kind of imagining, you know, we, we will only be following directions of Ben Gvir and Smotrich that tell us to eradicate entire villages with no checks and balances, that's a step too far for us. So they are talking about the occupation, but, you know, and they're uneased with the occupation, but also saying we will be willing to continue to support it if the Israeli government remains so-called democratic. So these are different ways that the issue is being introduced, but it's still, we need to recognize it, like it's still very much on the sidelines. Thank you for that. that was so clear and clarifying. And I want to ask you a little bit more actually about the military refusal. Um, you were a refuser 20 years ago. Yep. Um, you were in, in prison for two years for mm -hmm. in jail for two years for refusing. Um, how can you talk about uh, just so there was a, a wonderful, you published a wonderful piece yesterday in the in the 972, the English side yesterday or a few days ago from um, Shimrit Samerit, who I, was one of your your um, your partners years ago in, in refusal. <laughs> Cellmate. Mm -hmm. Cellmate. So you spent a lot of time together. So um, in this piece, Shimri talks about how um, the wave of refusal right now is unprecedented. What you what you also talked about, and that it's coming from so many different parts of the military, from, from and, and including from elite units and elite intelligence units, and um, and we know that pilots are refusing to or threatening to refuse to train pilots in the reserves, and um, there's a there's a lot going on right now. How how is this refusal, their refusal, being received in Israel? And I'm asking specifically your refusal 20 years ago was um, caught a lot of attention. Your your willingness to sacrifice two years of of your life in prison um, and yours and other people's, and you were a part of a wave of refusal around the time of the, of the second intifada. But can you talk about a little bit about how um, what you're seeing in terms of, of of how the refusal now is landing and what you think that means for these protests overall? Sure. Um, so I think there are largely kind of two different kinds of responses to this new wave of refusal. Um, one is focusing on questions of democracy. Um, and there you can see a split between people saying, yes, if the country is not democratic, then people are no longer bound to serve it. Um, that's kind of the, 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 the message, the main message of the new refuseniks um, is we've been a democracy, without democracy, we shouldn't be serving. Um, and then you have kind of the counter response from the right saying, no, this is democracy. And what's happening right now, whatever the government is doing, it's an elected government. It has a mandate from the people to do what it's doing. And you should obey this government as you have in the past. So there's the, that democratic conversation, which is much more lively than the one that we were facing 20 years ago when um, we were trying to talk about the occupation as much as possible. And we're met with these questions of democracy. It's kind of like, but you have to obey the the will of the people, and you have to obey the democratic government. Uh, and is it not undemocratic to refuse? And we were kind of trying to say it's not undemocratic because it's for a democratic cause of ending the military regime. Um, so, so even the people who criticize these refusals right now understand the claim of democracy better than they understand uh, claims about the occupation. The other aspect of the conversation that's happening, this is a microcosm of the, the entire discussion that's happening around the protest movement as well, um, is about the, the background of the people refusing. Again, um, secular um, 
often elites, like the fact that many of the people in Freezing are from elite units is not a coincidence. It is deeply tied to the demographics of the Israeli army and which sort of people end up in which sort of units. So if you take the commandos, um, the uh, Air Force pilots, and uh, the intelligence units, which are the three main kind of branches where you're seeing more refusal, these would mostly be people from Ashkenazi background, from the elites, from wealthy houses. Um, whereas kind of your rank and file soldiers, the border police, the Lani and Givati units that are sent to the front lines, the kind of police Palestinians, the press Palestinians on the ground, um, they're usually more from Mizrahi, Russian, Ethiopian background. Um, and that tension that has existed and, and has grown within the army between different units and between different backgrounds and between the politics of these different units is also playing out now. So people are saying it's time, like people on the, on the right um, are saying it's time to get rid of the elites that control these parts of the army as we're trying to get rid of these elites that control the media, academia, the judicial system. Uh, like we need to get, to get rid of these elites everywhere um, and replace them with people from the social periphery. Um, so that's kind of the other conversation that's happening. And, and that's often met with really terrible remarks from the protest movement saying, we are the ones who are paying taxes. We are the ones sustaining this government by serving in the, the this country, by serving in elite units. Like we are the country and we deserve to have more of a say than you, uh, people who don't pay taxes because you don't make enough money to pay taxes or, or so on. So you, you actually see this very elitist messaging from some of the protesters that invigorates this pushback from the Netanyahu camp. Um, and, and frankly, so these are terrible statements. Thank you for all of that, for that um, great nuanced window into Israeli stratification and, and how it is that the, the, the stratification of, of uh, Israeli society and the, the question of the old elites and the replacement of elites. Um, that was a great window into into those dynamics. So thank you for all of that. And also it, it, it is bringing me back to another question I wanted to ask you. You mentioned Hawara and um, the pogrom last week in Hawara and also in a village next to right around there, um, Zatara, and then more violence again from settlers this week. And the the violence this week, one of the things that that came out of it was a, a video of soldiers dancing with settlers in in Hawara, um, and a settler announcing something like, "Hevre, we Hawara is conquered. We've already got Hawara." Uh, while they're dancing together, um, one of the interesting uh, things. You've said so many interesting things, but one of the interesting things that you said was that protesters are were starting to push back. Uh, the, the message was catching on. The message from from the from the radical left was catching on a little bit more after after Hawara. Some of the um, the footage from protests a few days ago had protesters chanting at police, "Where were you in Hawara?" Can you un unpack for us then a little bit about this dynamic of um, what, what has been the police response to the protests? And what does it mean when protesters are chanting at the police, where were you in Hawara? Sure, so I think to an extent this is a given, but I do think this is a good time to kind of pause and contextualize. Like while we've been talking a lot about things that have been new with this government vis-a-vis -vis, um, Israelis, and like the so-called Jewish democracy or democracy for Jews, um, there's also apartheid. It's kind of been a thread throughout this conversation, but that has been ongoing. And the fact that this government and things we've seen now in Hawala, some of them are in escalation, but much more of what, what we're seeing, the military operations killing a lot of people, 
Um, and we're talking about at least a Palestinian a day killed since the beginning of 2023 uh, by Israeli soldiers. So uh, these things are much more of a continuation of previous policies than a break away from them. Um, and while some on the opposition to this government are suddenly saying, oh no, look what this government is doing with occupation. Oh no, they're building new settlements. Oh no, they're demolishing Palestinian homes. This is really something that the previous government, the government of change, which many of these demonstrators support or supported, um, were, was responsible for. Uh, like last year, the 2022, uh, which was dominated mostly by previous governments, was the government of change, saw a peak in demolitions and administrative detention and killing of Palestinians. So just to remember that while a lot of what is happening now is new in the field of Israel vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians, it's much more of a continuum, albeit another escalation. Um, that's just a little bit of context. Um, and then in terms of, of Kauai, I think it's really interesting. Like, yes, it has become um, a regular chant in demonstrations over the past week and a half. Where were you in Kauai? Uh, I myself am very torn about this slogan. I think the first few times I heard it, I was excited to see that people are suddenly um, allowing recognition of the occupation and, and its horrors like, into the conversation. And I do think that that's important. Um, on the other hand, I'm also aware of several Palestinian friends of mine who shared their criticism of, of this, really kind of opened my eyes to a different aspect of it. And that's the way that for at least some of them, I dare say most of them, this is a case of using Palestinian suffering for an internal Israeli conversation. And the, the, the reason I'm saying this is that, um, and you can see this in the context of the demonstration, it's one thing to chant like, where were you in Hawa, or talking about Hawa during kind of a rally when there's nothing really happening. And, and this is really, paying attention to Hawala. It's another thing entirely, I think, and this has been the majority of chanting, um, when it's a kind of a rallying cry vis-a-vis -vis police when there are clashes taking place, when the police is trying to disperse demonstrators with arrests and horseback mounted police and stun grenades and uh, water cannons and so on. That feels like, um, People saying, well, in Kawara, saw settlers setting houses and cars ablaze, killing a man. And we're demonstrating nonviolence. And yes, like in every protest in the past week and a half, there were more demonstrators arrested in the streets in Tunisia than there were amongst the hundreds of settlers attacking and scorching Palestinian houses. So the comparison is very, very painful, um, but also. And use that chant toward police saying, like, wait, you know, you shouldn't be using so much violence against us because you didn't do that against settlers over there, is kind of missing the point of Palestinians. Uh, it's just kind of comparing two groups of Israelis and law enforcement toward them. Um, instead of focusing on the more systematic oppression of Palestinians that the army is very complicit in. Um, and ever since the war, there were at least four more attacks, um, major attacks by, by settlers on Palestinian communities. And in all of them, the army was you know, standing idly by or supporting the attacks. Um, so ignoring that is very, very problematic. So I want to I want to ask you that was so valuable. Uh, I I want to ask you to to unpack this just a little bit more, if I may. So using Palestinian suffering for an internal Jewish conversation is how you just described one one way to look at this. Where were you in Hawara? Uh, chant this chant that 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 uh, that people are using. What would it look like? to use to, what would have to be different for people to actually be um, engaging with Palestinian suffering, engaging with what happened in Hawara, engaging in the, the um, 
the the structural violence that Palestinians are facing, what would that look like that would be different than than this chant? So right now you have speakers on the main stages in the Saturday Saturday night rallies. Those are the biggest kind of rallies that you have. Um, you have speakers that are actual war crimes, criminals, uh, talking about how important the system is to kind of defending them from charges of war crimes abroad. Um, so what it would look like is first removing those people from the stages and having more Palestinians speak. Um, and we've had a few cases of both Palestinians and Jewish Israelis who were invited to speak on stage and were censored and pre prevented from speaking because they had planned to talk about the occupation. So that really needs to change. Um, and talking about first and foremost, what is a part of it, why it's not democratic and including that in the messages of spines and speakers and everything that's connected to this movement would be a great start. Um, including Palestinian speakers, also very central. Um, and I think, yeah, just talking about the, the systematic nature of this issue and of how the lack of a cohesive justice-based uh, approach from the opposition, which I, I really don't want to call this opposition the left. Uh, we sometimes call it the camp that's left of the right, uh, left I mean, it, because that's really the that's kind of centralish, but not much of which is is actually on the right. I mean, some of the leaders are, of the movement were in Likud. Um, so, so trying to, to look at the lack of an alternative, how no serious opposition party, aside from uh, the very far left. Palestinian parties, nobody's offering the solution. The only way that they treat um, attacks by Palestinians is we should use war force, we should oppress Palestinians further. Um, and we, you know, the, the, the argument is, do we annex or do we not annex? But, but there's no question about the, the essence of Jewish supremacy as a guiding star for this regime. Uh, and that needs to change. Uh, it needs to change both morally and politically and it needs to change strategically because um, for this government to be replaced, the only way to get a majority it against the far right is by Palestinian citizens, Palestinian parties, playing a role in the opposition or an alternative coalition. And for that to happen uh, successfully, not like we've seen in the previous governments, the new government will have to offer uh, them equality. As, as an organizing principle for society, uh, as opposed to Jewish supremacy. And we are very far from that. Do you see this moment as an opportunity to move closer to that? Yes, I do, I do. Uh, I realize that much of the things that I've been saying are kind of to the contrary, kind of just recognizing the many hurdles in our way and how unprogressive this movement is. Um, but I'm also really encouraged by the mobilization of the anti-apartheid bloc in different demonstrations um, and by the willingness of people to actually pay attention. There's something about uh, masses of people going out of the streets, and we've seen this before in 2020 against Netanyahu and 2011, the social justice protests, um, where a movement can have its leaders and its organizing messages. But the people on the street that talk to each other, that think and talk and breathe politics more than they might have done their entire lives before, suddenly they're interested, suddenly they're asking questions, uh, suddenly they're confronted with things that they haven't before, suddenly they're being attacked by the police, um, suddenly they find themselves refusing to go back to the army, suddenly they, fi they find themselves divesting from the Israeli economy. You have, we have, haven't talked about that, but there's like a lot of people pulling all their money and moving it outside of the country, uh, either to safeguard it or as a means of protest. So when all these things are happening, there's a radicalization that happens almost by default. When you stop thinking of police 
as you know the ones that are there to maintain the order and you start actually questioning what is that order that they maintain if they're attacking me and saying saying that i used violence against them when i know that they didn't what does that mean when they say the same about attacking palestinians um when they're taught when we are talking about democracy can we really square talking about democracy and preventing democracy from an entire people like those questions are inevitably coming up on the streets every day right now uh and in op-eds and in conversations that people are having in their homes um and i think more than ever before there is really an opportunity to to be used here to be utilized um and even from the very narrow pragmatic standpoint of people understanding that they need Palestinians to push back against the right. This is something that Ayman Uda, at the time head of the joint list, now um, has been saying since 2015, like Palestinians can't get rid of the far right by themselves, but no one can do it without them. That's been kind of Ayman Uda's slogan. And I think people are now realizing that they need Palestinians to defend their lifestyle in Tel Aviv of the elites. Um, and that is opening up new opportunities, uh, I think, that we will see where, where they go. Thank you. And, and I, th I think that the uh, what you said earlier about how um, what the role of Palestinian politics becomes, whether it is a, a, a tool to further Jewish supremacy or Jewish internal Jewish conversations or wh or whether there is actually shared struggle and co-resistance this is this is on the table what direction that goes um, exactly. you have been so generous with your time I want to ask you one last question if if I may so earlier when you talked about what the what the threat of a total authoritarian government is uh, to to many different sectors and um to Palestinians first and, and foremost, and that is from the river to the sea, that threat, and then to many different sectors within, within Jewish society as well. You mentioned journalists and you, uh, are, you direct to outstanding media outlets. So I want to ask you um, to leave us with your thoughts on what is the important what it, what is the role of the media right now in this moment and the role of of independent media um what are the threats that you're facing and um and what do you want you have an, an audience in this podcast what do you want us to be paying attention to in terms of the um the possibilities and the threats for independent media at this moment sure so um thanks for that um i think Media broadly right now is a really kind of form across the political divide. We see entire outlets that are um, committed to supporting the protests and outlets that are committed to kind of resisting them. Um, we can really see that gap manifest in, in media. Um, our role in local call, which co-manages uh, co publishes with Just Vision and in Plus 970 magazine um, is to very much like I've been saying, very much like the role of kind of that, that anti-apartheid bloc in the administration. I think you play a part in supporting the movement, but also challenging it, kind of leading the struggle within the struggle that we are a part of because we need to stop uh, the Netanyahu government. Um, so that's our role right now. Um, it's making sure that people, both locally that are part of this movement and abroad that are paying attention, that are concerned with what is happening here, uh, that recognize rightly that Netanyahu is really moving as well uh, in deeper into the axis of authoritarian regimes like in Turkey, Russia, Hungary, and other places, um, and, and recognize the threat of that growing anti-liberal axis. Um, I think it's really important to make sure that those people um, are able to understand the difference or the, the specificity of the situation here where this isn't a shift from a democracy to an authoritarian regime because there's apartheid and recognizing that it's not 
you know, that Netanyahu is the big devil and everything was fine and will be fine if, if he's removed again. Um, there's something much deeper here and it is our role to make sure that people remember that. Um, in terms of risks, we've actually mapped, we have six pages written down, filled with the different kinds of risks we, we might face. We see this government already moving um, in different ways to silence the media. Uh, this looks like trying to shut down the Israeli uh, Public Broadcasting Corporation, which is um, really the only public sponsored um, mass media channel here that's not owned by private capitalists. Uh, and it's actually pretty good and pretty decent and they want to shut it down. Uh, they're trying to pass bills that will prevent media from taking pictures of soldiers, from publishing uh, recordings of phone calls and conversations. Uh, like there's a whole series of uh, legal measures that are being advanced. Um, while also at the same time, on the ground, the more soldiers and police feel that they have a free hand against demonstrators, against Palestinians, they also are being told that they have more of a free hand against journalists. And we've had some of our journalists that are on the front lines uh, this past year, um, under the previous government and under this one, uh, fall victim to attacks by settlers, police, and soldiers. Um, some of them were injured, some of them were arrested, uh, some of them had their equipment um, stolen or, or destroyed. Um, so, so that is a very, very real threat to our journalists on the ground. Um, and we're kind of working hard to offer mitigations in all these different fronts, uh, in the legal front, organizational, financial, um, and also offering protection to our people on the ground. Thank you for all of that, um, and and also for pointing out the 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 physical threat um, and the and the free hand against journalists. And we know that Israel. I mean, we are I think coming up on the one year anniversary of the of Israel's killing of uh, Shireen Abu Akleh and um, and these ongoing attacks against Palestinian journalists. And part of what you are describing is that the 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 use of um, of a free hand against Palestinians uh, allows for the imagining and the use of a free hand, even against the elite and the protected class, the Jews, um, the, the Jewish journalists. And I know that 972 journalists are Jewish and, and Palestinian. Um, yeah, of course, the Palestinian journalists are facing the most repression. That's undoubtable. Well, this was terrific. And um, I'm really grateful to you. You gave us a a, a, a real view of a um, an exceedingly um, painful and enraging and 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 frightening situation, and 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 also uh, laid out what look like opportunities and possibilities and direction and and vision for change. So all of that in one conversation. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I knew I could trust you for all of that, <laughs> guy. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank all of our listeners for tuning into this episode of Occupied Thoughts. Please come to our website, uh, www.fmep.org, for links and resources related to this podcast, uh, related to 972, for lots of other rich content related to Palestine uh, and to Israel. And please make sure that you are subscribed to this podcast so that you can stay up to date. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify. You can watch video versions of our podcasts, including this one on YouTube. And with that, I am Sarah Ann Minkin signing off until the next episode. Thank you so much. Thank you.